So what we'll see is some genetic diseases are, can also be sex-linked. So we just talked about a few different autosomal genetic diseases. Now we're going to talk about sex linkage. And basically what that means is that the gene for these disorders is located on the sex chromosomes, the 23rd pair, so the X and the Y. So when we look at the X and Y, here's the X chromosome and here is the Y chromosome. We learned that the Y chromosome is significantly smaller than the X chromosome. So technically they have non-homologous regions. So because the X chromosome is so much longer. So there's many genes on the X chromosomes at, at these regions, which are not present on the Y chromosome because the Y chromosome is just so, so small that it doesn't have the room for these genes. So sex-linked traits are those which are carried on the X chromosome, typically in these non-homologous regions. Um, and so the alleles in these regions are expressed whether they're dominant or recessive, since there's no alternate allele carried on the Y chromosome, specifically in males. So that's why their sex-linked genetic disorders are more common in males. So here are two examples of sex-linked genetic disorders, hemophilia and colorblindness. So these are both examples that are more prevalent in males because, for example, so hemophilia we've spoken about before in the past. This is a genetic disorder that um, people with hemophilia, they have an inability to clot their blood. And so they can't produce those clotting proteins or those clotting factors and so when they get some sort of cut or a bruise, um, their blood doesn't clot properly and they don't heal properly. So color blindness is the inability to distinguish between green and red. And you probably have heard that this is more common in males. So what does that mean? That means that the gene for color blindness, so if we look at over here, these genes are located at this region over here. So we'll come back to this idea. So similar to when we write the codominant alleles, when assigning alleles for a sex-linked trait, since we're working with the X and Y chromosomes, we use Xs with superscripts to represent the affected and unaffected individuals. So hemophilia and colorblindness are both recessively sex-linked inherited disorders. So what does that mean? If you look at the females in this diagram, females have the option to be carriers or they can be unaffected or they can be affected. In this case, this individual, this first individual is normal, all right, because they have two unaffected genes. All right, so for this individual, she is a carrier. So let's say we're talking about hemophilia. This person does not have hemophilia, this girl, because she has two unaffected alleles. This person is a carrier because she has one affected allele. So she is heterozygous. So she would be, in this case, big H, little h. All right, but she is, does not have hemophilia. She would only have hemophilia if she had two affected genes. However, in the males, this is a normal male, okay, because he has an unaffected gene or unaffected allele on the X chromosome. But remember that the Y chromosome is much shorter. So there is no other gene for this blood clotting protein on the Y chromosome. So it's only this gene that's having an effect on their blood clotting. So for this individual, he inherited an X chromosome with the affected gene. And so he is affected because he has one gene for hemophilia. So basically males cannot be carriers of a sex-linked X trait. So this is basically breaking down what we just spoke about. 
Okay, so color blindness and hemophilia both inherited the same way. So let's look, focus on color blindness. Like I said, it's the inability to distinguish between green and red. So the red green gene is located on the X chromosome and specifically down here at this locus. And the normal vision is dominant over color blindness. Okay, so color blindness is recessive, just like hemophilia is recessive. So if we look at the females, right, normal female versus affected female versus carrier female, all right, it's still, we're still working with the same dominant recessive rules, right? Two dominant are going to give us normal, all right, two recessives on the X chromosome are going to give us an affected female who has color blindness, all right, but this individual has a dominant and a recessive, so she is a carrier. She does not have color blindness, but if you notice, like I said, the males cannot be carriers because they are only have one X, so if they have an X with the normal gene, they will be normal and not have color blindness, but if they have an X with the affected gene, then they will be affected and have color blindness. So let's do a quick cross. So what are the chances of a colorblind child in the cross between a normal male and a carrier mother? So here's our carrier. Okay, so remember one dominant, one recessive for our carrier. She does not, she is not colorblind. All right, and the normal male, he is XY and he has the normal X. So take a second and see if you can fill out this Punnett square. Remember, we'll put one parent up here, one parent on the side. And you should get something like this. Okay, so XY, the father is going up here. All right, and then the mother XX is going over here. So we would end up with all the females. These are the females. Remember, there's a 50% chance of females, 50% chance of males every time. All right, but will the females be colorblind? The answer is no. If they have a female, she would either be homozygous dominant or she would be a carrier. All right, but their females would, their daughters will not be colorblind. However, for the males, there's a 50% chance that their son will be colorblind. That would be this individual. And there's a 50% chance that their son will not be colorblind. That's this individual. Okay, and the last thing that we need to talk about is um, radiation and chemicals and the fact that they increase the mutation rate and could cause genetic diseases and cancer. So remember that if the mutation is occurring in the somatic cells, it could lead to cancer. If the mutation is caught is is occurring in the gametes, it could lead to genetic diseases in the following generation. Okay, so we know that a gene mutation is a change to the base sequence of a gene that can affect the structure and function of the protein that it encodes. So mutations can be spontaneous. Sometimes it just happens randomly or exposure to certain external factors such as radiation, chemicals, and even some biological agents such as bacteria and viruses have been known to cause mutations or increase the chances of mutations as well. So radiation, meaning like UV rays from the sun, um, gamma radiation, or even x-rays from medical equipment, chemicals, all right, it could be any type of chemical found in pollutants or any type of chemicals found in cigarettes. Um, and so what we call these, anything that causes a genetic mutation and is known to cause a genetic mutation is referred to as mutagens. Okay, so here are just some examples. And we know that carcinogens are just anything that is known to cause cancer. Okay, so this leads us to two instances in history that are really important to talk about and understand the consequences of radiation after the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and the accident as, at Chernobyl that you've 
probably most likely heard about. So the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima, as well as Nagasaki, um, occurred in August 1945 during the final stages of World War II. You probably remember talking about this in social studies and where we dropped um, a nuclear bomb on these, these um, areas in Japan. And the Chernobyl accident occurred in 1986 when there was an explosion of a nuclear power plant and there was a meltdown um, and release of an extensive amount of radioactive material. So of these two incidents, this is the bombing at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All right, and this is showing Chernobyl. So more people died from Hiroshima, but what they found is that Chernobyl released far more radiation, about 400 times. And the reason why was because the Hiroshima nuclear bomb was detonated above ground. And so they found that the radiation was dispersed, resulting in less radiation that actually got into the soil and remained there. But the Chernobyl meltdown, first of all, there was, it produced different isotopes that had much larger half-life. So the effects over generations um, they found or believe are more far reaching. And so here are some of the long-term consequences of the radiation exposure for both of them. So there was an increase in cancer development, all right, because remember, radiation increases the chance of cancer. There was also reduced T cell counts. Remember, T cells are part of our, um, our immune system. And so there was altered immune fun functions and that obviously caused more infections. Um, and there are also wide varieties of organ-specific health effects. So it affected people's livers, um, but these consequences were specific to the types and amounts of radiation. So what they found was thyroid disease was a common consequence of the Chernobyl accident, um, but, and there was no significant increase in birth defects following the Hiroshima bombing. And these are not things that you need to memorize, but understand the effects of radiation in an area. And Hiroshima is still habitable and well populated today. However, certain regions of Chernobyl remain unsafe for human habitation still at this point years later. Okay, and that's it for today. So just make sure that you log on to Google Classroom and that we'll also post these slides in addition to the video and just complete your Google form and submit for the day. All right, enjoy the rest of your day.